So many years ago, uh, my husband and I always still has this struggle. He's a movie buff, I'm not. Um, I don't believe in exerting any emotions for any other reasons. I deal with real life situations, so I don't want to be scared. You know, I don't want to be, I don't want a mystery. I don't want none of that. I want to laugh. And so we very seldom find movies that we kind of like. And so this is one of the movies that we, we watched some years ago called Blended. Anybody ever saw the movie Blended? It's really funny. Um, it has Adam Sandler and Drew Barrymore in it. And it's interesting. I don't want to tell the whole thing because I want you to go watch it. But it's two people who find themselves on this island um, on the vacation that their bosses have given them, but it is a blended family retreat. And so they go through all of these activities of trying to blend two families together and how this works and how it doesn't work and all of the ins and outs. And I thought it was interesting because um, up until recently, I had never known what the term blended was. Um, it was something that I never used or we never used. Um, and then I found out that I guess my family kind of falls into what they call the blended category. Tanisha said something in the back earlier that the problem is with that blended term is that you want to take everything and mush it together and make it become one. And I don't think that that's the idea that God has for the family. Because we are all individuals and we are all separate in our own entities and we should uh, uh, celebrate that. That's just like when people say that they're colorblind. You should not be colorblind. You should recognize the beauty of all the different colors and ethnicity that God has created. And so it's amazing how when we talk about blended and we get lots of questions about blended families because trying to take two families to become one is a hard thing. Now see, the problem is we grew up, uh, well not us, some people <laughs> grew up on the Brady Bunch and um, it all just worked, you know. He had, she had three, he had three and they came together and they just lived happily ever after and, and we know that that usually ain't the case. But uh, we fall in this category, but I never knew what it was. We've never used that term. Um, I am one of, of seven siblings. Now, understand how this happened. Uh, my mother and my father were never married, but I was my father's only biological child. My father adopted twins on the right, Brian and Brianna. Actually, Brianna just graduated from Central State University this year, class of 2022. <laughs> And then my mother married my bonus father, and he had three bonus children. Um, and then they, my mother and my bonus father had a child together who is my sister who was not here this morning. Pray for her. And so we all are family. Now let me ask you a question. How many half-sisters and brothers do I have? None. They all mine. We've never distinguished step half, uh, we never used those terms. So we didn't grow up saying, that's my stepbrother, or that's my stepsister, or that's my half, or we just believed that we were all family and we were raised that way. And guess what? It worked. We're still to this day grown, still part of our, each other's lives. We love each other and we still do life together. Even though my bonus father has gone on to be with the Lord, we still are together as a family. And so it's amazing to me how when we are so busy trying to separate ourselves or define our familiar relationships, I think that's part of the problem when we bring families together. And we're in this series, Family, the Beautiful Mess, and I'm telling you, we've been talking about some great things. I've been getting lots of messages. Thank you. Um, it's good to get good emails. You know, I get bad emails too, <laughs> but it's good to get good emails and just testimonies of some of the things that God is revealing about their family and, and what's happening. And it's amazing, this is one of those series where you can't blame it on somebody else. We, we, the, the, this bud's for you, I keep saying that. This one is to look within. And so we've been through a lot of the things and a lot of situations about the Old Testament, the first family, what happened, why the enemy is after family. We understand that we're called to be image bearers. And so the enemy is trying to attack that so that people are uh, drawn away from Christianity. You do know people are drawn away from Christianity, right? Uh, we went to Columbus not too long ago, 
and we were in um, Polaris. And I promise, I don't remember, it was a Thursday, I think, Thursday evening. And I started to walk around, and there were more women in hijab than there were women without. And so at first, I was just kind of, if you don't know what hijab is, it is the, 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 um, the head covering and the covering that Muslim women wear. And so at first, I thought, like, is it a, is it a convention? I mean, what, what, what is happening? You know, what, what's going on? And so we walked around, and literally there were more Muslims in the mall than anything. And so I kind of got a little bothered by that. And so I was like, well, let's go to Easton. Let's go to another part of Columbus. So, you know, I want to go to a mall, anywhere where a mall count me in. And when I walked in Macy's, and the, the, the mannequins were dressed in hijab. And I'm looking around, and it was more women in hijab. And I'm like, God, what are you trying to show me? What, what, what is happening? He said, where are the Christians? And I understand that we're in hard times and perilous times, but I also understand that it is time for us to rise up and be who God has called us to be unapologetically. What? And, and, and don't, don't make me go viral, but I don't care. Um, we have to be able to be the true manifestation of Jesus, not this fake and this one-sided and all that other stuff we're seeing out there now, but really showing people the true love of Jesus. And the true love of Jesus is for all. It is for whosoever. It is for everyone who comes in his name, who comes to him to love on them, not to be mean and, and, and want to fight and all this other stuff. That's not who we are called to be. We can have our own opinions, but it would come down to the gospel. The gospel is still right. Come on, church. You can't love Jesus and hate your brother. That, that just, that don't, that don't work. Prejudice is still wrong. That is a condition of the heart. You can't say that you are for Jesus and you are prejudiced or you are discriminatory or any of those things because that's not the true love. And so we have to start being who God said we are and really reflecting, not this pseudo Christian, I don't know why I'm going here, not the Americanized Christianity, but the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't send me no email about that. <laughs> and so it's important. And this is why the enemy is fighting us. And he's trying to attack. He wants me to be quiet. I will not be quiet. <laughs> Matter of fact, you'd have had a better chance of me being quiet if you left me alone. But the fact that you bothering me, that's going to push me forward. So, but we're on this thing. And, and so we've been talking about some really keys that if you take them home and apply them to your family, things will start to change. Now, it won't change overnight. But if you start working it, you'll see the fruit of what God is trying to do. And so we want to talk about the blenders. I get lots of questions about blended families. I counsel lots of blended families. And it's amazing how usually the behaviors you see in blended families are mimicked behaviors. Children are usually disrespectful because they see disrespect. There's some type of uh, issue with the order that usually comes in to make these situations chaotic. Because if everybody stayed where they're supposed to be and in their role, there won't be a lot of movement to do anything different. And so family is family, whether it's one you start with, the one you end up with, or the family you gain along the way. I come from a very loving family, but we got family everywhere. I got sisters that's not my biological sisters, but they're still my sisters, neither less, you know. And so it's amazing. My father um, and my uncle have been doing foster care for a long time. My husband and I did foster care for about eight years. When we were 22 years old, we had five teenage foster kids under the age of, from the ages of 13 to 17, living in my house at one time. Hallelujah. So I'm glad I'm delivered. <laughs> But it was because we didn't have children of our own at the time, and we wanted to help as much as possible. And they were family, and they still call us to this day. 
mama and daddy and they say, oh, I got this son, he's 34. He said, he's your son. Yep, he's my son, he's 34, he's my son. Um, but it's because family is just not who you were given, it's who you collect along the way. And so we are to be family, just like this is a family, to encompass anyone who does not have family, but we'll talk about that later. So let's move on, what we wanna talk about today We talked about last week about the first family and what happened, and we talked about the week before Cain killed Abel and that whole thing, and we talked about how the family went wrong. Well, we did get back in the New Testament to set up the correct order of the Christian family, and it is found in Ephesians 5, 22, 33. It's a lot of reading, um, but just bear with me. Uh, Verse 22, where's my wives at? Wives, let me see. If you're a wife, where's your Come on. All right, just want to make sure I'm talking to the right people. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit and everything to their husbands. Husbands, where my husband's at? Oh, just want to make sure I'm in the right house. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Hallelujah. You know, I'll get there, huh? For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Have you ever seen that that show on TLC called Smothered? Okay, never mind. Wrong crowd. But a man is supposed to leave his parents. This mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Where the kids at? Let me see, kids, where are you at? Where the children at? I know some of them in children's church, but some of them sitting here. All right, just wanna make sure you're in the house. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. Can I stop there for a second? The scripture says, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land. Do you know how long you live depends on how much you honor? I remember one time, this is for the kids, this is for my young people. I remember one time I just thought my mama ain't know nothing. She was mean, I didn't like her. She just didn't know nothing. I was out trying to live my best life, and she was just trying to stop me. And so I came home from school one day, and I decided that we were having, um, I went to Cleveland Public Schools, and we were having a cheerleading competition. And I wanted to go. Well, I hadn't done nothing else I was supposed to do. I hadn't cleaned no room. Layla, I hadn't did no homework. I ain't did nothing, but I was going to the competition. And so my mother said, you're not going. I was like, whatever, okay. I say that out loud because you died back then if you did. I've said it in my head. And so my plan was that I was going to go anyway. So I called my friend and I told him, okay, don't knock on the door. Just drive by, beep the horn. Y'all looking at me funny. Beep the horn and I'm going to come out. And so the time came, we were supposed to leave at 5.30, the thing started at six o'clock. Miraculously, I fell asleep. So he come by, he beeping the horn, beeping the horn, beeping the horn, and guess who came to the door? My mama. So I didn't go to the cheerleading competition. But that same car was involved in a shooting that individual got killed that night. When you obey, your days 
may be long upon the land. I didn't want to obey, and I even tried, it not, tried not to, but it made the most important impact on what I believe from that moment on about what my parents were trying to tell me. You do know that we're not trying to hurt you in any way that we are only trying to tell you what is best. We're trying to get you not to make the same mistakes and learn from our experiences. But the Lord got on me about that because our experiences is what made us who we are. So we don't have a right to rob you of an experience because experience makes the most important impact on what you believe. I'm teaching good. I only got a third of a voice left and I'm teaching good. So, I, and I need you to hear me say that because I know your parents say that all the time, but maybe you need to hear somebody else say that. It's not that we want to hurt you, but sometimes we try to rob you of your own experience. Back to the scripture. Verse three. No, let's start to honor your father and your mother that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, my father's in the house. I got any fathers in the house, fathers. This is very important. Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instructions of the Lord. A lot of times what's happening is kids rebel because there's no consistency and there's no discipline and there's no bringing up in the ammunition of the Lord. And so we wanna tell them what to do right, but we don't wanna show them. And kids listen more to what you do than what you say. The problem with this whole generation now and the whole church thing is that most of the people in millennial, generational X, kind of a little bit, latter part of generational X, maybe millennial generation, they refused to come to church or they walked away from the faith. Why? because they saw one thing at home and they were taught another thing at church. And so what they've done is now they refuse to be fake. That's that word authentic that we keep hearing. We want authentic, we want people to be real. You want people to be real, but you don't want me to be so real, too real. But they have walked away from the faith because we lived, not we, because my mama lived what she, what she taught in church but a lot of people experience hypocrisy in their own home, so now they've walked away from the faith. That was fathers provoking their children. We think provoking is just getting up in their face and causing them to, to, to buck or to whatever. No, it's beyond that. It is that you can't teach one thing and live something else. So to summarize this, is as easy as possible. This is a teaching lesson. We did a lot of scripture today because people don't come to Bible study no more, so I got to throw it in on a Sunday morning. A wife characterized by submission, a husband who loves his wife sacrificially, children who obey and honor their parents, and parents who instruct and discipline their children by being a consistent, godly example. Most of the time, our children don't do what we ask because we haven't been consistent in what we said we were going to do. Hallelujah. Move on. So husbands, we want to get back to you. A husband can love his wife best when he loves God first. And this is not just husbands. I'm going to say men, period. Young men, older men, you have to have a real relationship with God if any relationship after that is going to work. You have to know him really because that's where a relationship comes from. If you don't have a solid relationship with God, nothing else that comes out of that is going to work. And an enemy will fool you and make you think it's working for a minute, but it is headed for some type of destruction because there's going to come a time when you're going to run into something you don't know how to fix. I, I said I'm going to be a football coach when I finish doing this. I'm, I'm going to retire and be a, be a football coach. You know how the play is busted? I'm using football terms, I'm sorry. And you gotta call an audible, meaning they gotta do something else because they've even seen the play or run the play. You gotta stop living your lives on audibles. Meaning, instead of letting God call the play, you call in your own plays and then when they don't work, then you call on God. 
That is not how it is set up to be. He's the architect. He has the plan. So he has everything that you need to be successful in life. But you cannot just call him when it messes up. When your way doesn't work, you have to establish the love of God first. And when you love God first, that helps you to love your wife and to love your children and to love everyone else around you. But if you don't love God, you don't know how to love your wife. Come on, church. And women, when we talk about submission, because there's another scripture that says that husband and wives are to submit to one another. Now, submission is an attitude of the heart, a daily journey of faith, where you choose to see Jesus in your marriage, not just a leadership style from your husband. Can I, can I tell you my submission has nothing to do with my husband? Because sometimes I don't even like him. Oh, yeah. See, I told you, everybody want real, and then you say something real, and then they're like, oh, my goodness, you said that in church. I love him, but I'm just saying, sometimes I don't like him. And if my submission is based on like, then I'm going to get in trouble with Jesus because now I'm not submitting because I don't like him. When I'm submitted to the Father, submission is automatic to my husband. Y'all looking at me deep today. I'm already working hard. Submission, a wife voluntarily recognizes and yields her will to her husband who has been called by God to provide leadership in the home. It's amazing how a lot of times they want the wife to follow, but the husband won't lead. And then if you're leading and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, where are you leading me to? I'm not a ride or die. I got questions. <laughs> now, I'm a ride with you. <laughs> I'm a... <laughs> We're going to roll. I got questions. You, you can't just be leading me, and I don't know what standard in which you're leading me by. Y'all don't got questions. Okay, it's just me. Move on, Pastor. I only got a little bit of voice left. Let me hold on. Let's go. A husband will be held to greater accountability before God as leader in the home. When your house is out of whack, it is your fault. Oh, God. No matter what's happening, it's your fault as the man, as the leader, as the husband man. Because even though you may not have anything to do with it, you should have the resource to go to the Father to make sure that you know what words to speak and what actions to take to make it right. If your children are out of control, why are you always looking at their mama? Ooh, them kids bad. We don't ever look at the husband. But yet it is the husband that is supposed to be leading. It is the husband that is the discipline. My children, they know. My kids... It ain't, it's not even about a whooping or anything with him. They don't want to disappoint their father. Just like I don't want to disappoint my father. Move on, Pastor. A Christian wife can challenge her husband with a humble spirit which still strives to honor his leadership. I tell my sons all the time, you don't want to marry no doormat. You don't want to be in somebody that you can walk over. You don't want to be with somebody that you could just rule because that's not going to help you. You need to help me. You need somebody. You need somebody that's going to call you on your stuff. You need somebody that knows Jesus and can go to the Father before you because you ain't all that. No, just me. I t here's another example. A husband should be able to, I mean, a wife should be able to challenge her husband in a humble spirit. My husband and I used to have a fight all the time. Guess what it was about? Because he didn't think that he could play the piano and sing at the same time. I promise you. And we used to argue every week. Because I used to say, you really can sing and play at the same time. And he used to be like, no, I can't. You don't play no piano. You think you know everything. I'm just saying. It can't be that hard.
And he used to go back and forth. And every week, and I was like, well, just try it. I'm telling you, they need to, your voice needs to be heard. He has the type of voice, you heard it this morning, it will steal the enemy. And I'm like, it needs to be heard. You can play and sing at the same, no, I can't, no, I can't, no, I can't. That wasn't being disrespectful. That was, I was challenging him, yes, but I was challenging him because there was more in him. You need a woman that can pull God's best out of you. Then he said he couldn't preach. But I've learned to be humble enough to challenge him and still respect his manhood and him as being the husband of my house. And as we submit, and I submit to him and we submit to one another, God has been able to move in our lives. The marriage relationship is to model the relationship between Christ and his church. We should look like how Christ loved the church so much that he died for her. See, men, my husband teaches this all the time, you have to lay down your life for your wife. That means you may have to die to what you want. You may have to die to your flesh. You may have to die to a lot of things. But in that return, then, then as Christ, the woman submits and serves and respects her husband. I know this sounds like old time stuff, but this is the real plan. This is how this is supposed to be working. We don't see it a lot today, but it is God's plan. And you can have it in your life if you submit to it. Here's the issue. This is what our families have become because we have reversed roles. We don't know our role. When you get out of sync and out of role, it becomes a mess. And then you have kids running the house as the husband. Parents who are obeying their children. Hus wives who've taken the husband's role and running everything. And then you wondering why the, 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 the bonus child is trying to run you because they see running in that marriage. Husbands cowering down and not being in their role. It's a role reversal. And just as funny as that picture looks, that's how some of our families look. Well, how do you know, Pastor? Because I lived it. Many years ago when Joshua was born, when he was actually, the day he was born, my husband was there. Right after he was born, my husband got a phone call that he, need, he was needed in ministry. So my husband left me in the hospital with a newborn baby for three days by myself. You talking mad? First of all, I wasn't even sure if I wanted this baby. Second of all, I had two under two. And I was not in a good place mentally at all. And you left me by myself for three days with a newborn baby. When he came to pick me up on the third day, I had decided that I was going to switch roles. And so Joshua became the head of the house. See, understand, Joshua was medically fragile. And so I've told the story many times before of how much time we spent in intensive care in the hospital. He'd stop breathing 
he coded all of those terrible things. So his needs came before anybody else's needs. And because I was hurt in the fact that I felt abandoned and I felt left alone, I literally and figuratively put Joshua in his father's place. So much to the fact that I would hear his father coming home and Joshua was such a good baby, he just lay there and played with his feet. That's just what he did. And I would hear his father coming and I would run and get him out of his bassinet and put him on his father's side of the bed. Just to let you know, ain't nothing happening up in here. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. I know. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just out here by myself, my Marissa. It's just me. But I chose to get out of my role. And I knew I was dead wrong. I was convicted. But because the hurt that I had felt, it just wouldn't allow me to forgive and let it go. And so we lived in that role reversal for a little bit of time until the Lord spoke to me one day. And he said, you need to get back in your place. He said, and put Joshua back in his place and allow your husband to be who I've called him to be. And I want to tell y'all, I did it right away. No, it was a struggle. And it's amazing to me that I had to do that without an apology. Because I understand something that if you do what God is calling you to do, he will handle the rest. But so many times we want to be, we want to be justified and we want to be vindicated and, and we want all of these things. So that gives us an excuse not to be in the role that we know we should be in. But that's why God can't get in the midst because ain't nobody right. Somebody has to make the decision to be right. Somebody has to make the decision to get in their rightful place no matter what else is happening. And so I made a decision that day. I said, okay, God, I'm going to need you to help me to get back into that place. And some years went by and I was working on getting back into that place. And that little boy came home, told me he had a girlfriend. I said, you got a what? And then it hit me. These little jokers going to leave you. And you're going to be stuck with this one. Now, what your relationship is going to determine what you're going to put the work in. That's why the, the statistics say so many people get divorced after 18 or 20 years because they just were doing the kid thing. And then when the kids grew up and moved out, they didn't have nothing else left because they was in the wrong roles. And that helped me get all the way back in my role real quick. And they'll tell you, they'll come, and they'll be like, Ma, we want to go, uh-uh, I'm going with my man. I ain't going with you. Nope. Uh-uh. Why? Because there's a role. And if I stay in my role, God will honor my house. It's imperative that you go home this week and you have a conversation with Jesus to make sure you know your role as a child, as a teenager. And you say, well, I'm a single parent. Exactly. You still have a role and your husband is the Lord. Well, I don't have a family yet as a man. Exactly. You, that's still your role, though. You need to govern yourself. You need to have a relationship with God. When all the pieces are in the right places. The highest form of worship is order. We think falling out and laying slain in the spirit and all that's great. But when there is order... He can come in and do whatever.
whatever he needs to do in your life, in your family, but you have to be in your role. Lord God, we thank you this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the small nudgings to let us know that you have a plan for us. That we humble ourselves and that we find that role that we become the image bearers. That we become who and what you've called us to be. We ask all these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on and give the Lord.